Welcome to the uh, Distinguished Lecture Series, sponsored by the Center for Causal Discovery. Uh, as many of you know, the aims of the Center include uh, developing and disseminating algorithms uh, and systems for biomedical scientists who are interested in causal discovery uh, from large biomedical data sets. Uh, another key aim is to train biomedical scientists and uh, data scientists in how to apply these methods. So the center uh, has been sponsoring a lecture series to recognize distinguished leaders yeah. in the field of causal discovery uh, and to provide a forum for them to let us know about some of the cutting edge developments uh, in the field. So it's uh, a pleasure to welcome back one of our own, Frederick Averhard, who um, got a PhD in the Department of Philosophy in 2007, was a student of uh, Clark and myself, uh, and uh, my recollection, probably faulty, but was that um, uh, Frederick uh, basically was extremely smart and well prepared, uh, but not launched until we gave him the right topic. Uh, I was doing experiments with the causality lab, having students look at uh, figuring out a sequence of experiments they could do to learn the causal structure of a system, <clears throat> and then measuring what they did and seeing how it compared to what the ideal behavior would look like. Uh, I then realized that we didn't know what the ideal behavior looked like, and that was a great thesis topic. And so I talked to Frederick Clark, and I uh, talked to him, uh, and we, we all three of us huddled and got a, a little tiny result. And then Frederick sort of launched the rockets and went <laughs> and wrote a beautiful thesis, and then got a job at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Before that, a postdoc at Berkeley, uh, in the middle of postdoc with us at the uh, McDonald Foundation. Uh, funding, and then a uh, job as a professor in the Division of Humanities uh, and Social Sciences at Caltech. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have him, and uh, we hope he comes back uh, every year, and uh, uh, we make sure we get him in the winter so we make sure he understands what real people look like. We had to dig up his winter coat apparently yesterday, so uh, it's a brutal life out there in California. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I did dig up my winter coat yesterday. Thank God I brought it. Um, it's great to be back. And uh, uh, I recall starting at, well, I applied to CMU wanting to do a thesis in logic. Thank God I didn't do that. But uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, um, you see now there's this enormous group here. Uh, at the time, there wasn't quite as much enthusiasm for causality. So. Uh, it's great to see this really flourish. The work I'm going to be presenting today is uh, work that I've been doing over the last several years with the group in Finland. Antti Hutinen and Matti Jarvisalo have been uh, my closest collaborators over the several years, and it's really also in large part due to them that we have these uh, results that I'm going to be presenting today. Um, I will start by hopefully giving you a perspective on causal discovery that you all share so that we start from the same page. Uh, hopefully this is entirely familiar to you. And then I, my aim is to give you uh, uh, or present to you our results on what I think is a really new and a really exciting, very versatile way of approaching causal discovery in many, many different <coughs> fields. And uh, I hope that this will uh, uh, get you interested in a toolbox that uh, may be applicable to your, uh, your, your um, <coughs> problems in causal discovery. The idea overall, the picture is we have a, a, um, a standard statistical data set. Uh, we make a whole pile of assumptions about how we think the statistical data set might be uh, connected to the underlying um, generating system. And we want to develop inference algorithms that then give us some insight over perhaps the equivalence class of causal models, perhaps over some type of parameters that fix the causal models. And we want to say, in general, the causal structure will be underdetermined, yet we want to see what might be fixed. What can we tell? What uh, uh, inferences can we draw from the data set that we have about what's going on causally? This is the overall picture that I take it uh, people in causal discovery who develop methods uh, engage in. And then the question is, how can we vary the assumptions? What kind of output can we get? Uh, um, how, uh, what, what are the statistical methods that we might want to apply? In the kinds of things that I'll be presenting today, uh, what I'll be particularly interested in is to find a very, very general model space. I'm, uh, uh, as you are well aware, probably, 
uh, one of the constraints on the model space that is often made for causal discovery is that we assume that there are no latent variables or that there are no cycles. We often assume that there that the faithfulness and the Markov assumption hold. In general, uh, in some cases, we even want to say that there is some type of parametric assumption about how the causal um, variables are related. And then there are a whole pile of algorithms that take different sets of these assumptions and uh, uh, use them to infer something about the underlying causal structure. Um, in the work that I'm presenting, the particular uh, um, assumptions that I'm interested in weakening are the assumptions of causal sufficiency, that there are no unmeasured common causes, and the assumption of acyclicity, that there is no feedback. So the work that we've been doing has really been trying to generalize causal methods to a space where we can distinguish cases where there are latents from cases where there are cycles from cases where there are latents and cycles in uh, the underlying uh, uh, causal system. And as you will see, that is really uh, not something that other algorithms have done. Uh, all the other extant algorithms have either assumed some type of, made some type of assumption about causal sufficiency or have made some assumption about acyclicity. The other part, so, so one aim of the method that I want to present is uh, that we can get rid of both of those assumptions. The other is that I want to have a method, uh, or the method that I'll be presenting allows you to integrate uh, um, results or statistical data from different settings. You might have investigated your uh, variables of interest in an experiment, you might have performed experiments, or you might have done a passive observational study. In the passive observational study, you might not have measured exactly the same type of variables that you measured in your experiment. And so we get different data sets that are even by, uh, from the outset distributionally different because they will include interventions, yet we assume that there is some true underlying generating model that you have investigated in one case in the experimental setting by intervening on a particular variable and in another case maybe by just observing uh, the variables that are there. So the uh, um, approach that I will be presenting today says that it doesn't matter where your data comes from. You need to know where your data comes from, what you intervene on, but we want to integrate results from very different settings. Um, so the uh, uh, idea is to extend this picture uh, like this, that we have different, uh, that we consider a different set of assumptions about the inference procedure. We allow for different uh, um, experimental or observational settings that we use to generate our data. And then I want to go one step further and really focus on the role of background knowledge as well. I think in many settings uh, of causal discovery, we have an enormous amount of background knowledge in the literature. That background knowledge might come in different forms and with different certainties attached to it. Yet it could be an enormous help in trying to uh, um, reduce the type of underdetermination that our uh, causal discovery procedure um, um, outputs. So in particular, you might say, I already know that particular causal variables are directly related or that they are not directly related. But the background knowledge might come also in a weaker form where you say, I know that a particular variable x has a cause on uh, or is a cause of uh, a particular variable w, but I have no idea what the pathway is. Um, it's, that's a much vaguer constraint than saying, I know there is an edge or there is not an edge in the graph. And, but still, it's a useful constraint that might help me in uh, determining what the true causal structure is. Similarly, I might have a tier or I have, might have knowledge about tier orderings of the variables. I might know that x and y would come before z and w, but I don't know in which way they come before z and w. Um, or in the most general sense, I might have some type of probabilistic knowledge where I'd say this as priors in inverted commas, where I have in mind, you might have very specific ideas in terms of a probability distribution over graphs. You might, but you might, so, so then you might say, well, perhaps a Bayesian procedure would be useful here. But the prior knowledge in this general form might also come in a much weaker form. You might say, I have with a certain degree of confidence the sense that the, uh, the causal relations in this, among this set of variables are relatively sparse. It's a vague kind of constraint. You might not be able to formulate exact probabilities for that type of a constraint, yet it is prior information that might be useful 
uh, uh, to constrain the search space. And it's prior information that you might also not be 100% confident about. So uh, you want to somehow enter this type of background knowledge in a way that it doesn't completely swamp or predetermine what your output is going to be, but uh, that it can influence it. Of course, part of causal discovery is also challenging that background knowledge, so you might want to be flexible in including that background knowledge or uh, leaving it out. Finally, I want to allow uh, or the, the, the uh, uh, sad faced approach that I'll be presenting is one where that is versatile in terms of the different settings where my data comes from uh, in how it applies to different settings. And I just want to give you two very different scenarios, I think, uh, where both of which we've uh, used this approach on and where I think it uh, can be extremely um, uh, fruitful. So one is uh, something that you, some of you might have seen before is work that has been done by uh, Sergey Police and David Danks, where they assume that you have a set of variables that are evolving in a time series. Uh, there is some type of system level causal structure that I'm representing here. I suppose that's the true time steps that I'm uh, representing here, but the red arrows are indicating that I'm only getting a subset. I, I only sample the system at some uh, lower rate than the actual true process is occurring at. And the worry is that if I infer my causal structure on the basis of this type of uh, subsample rate, that the causal structure might, very, <coughs> might look very different from what it actually is at the system scale, at the system time scale. So that's one type of setting where I might have particular problems for my inference about the true causal structure that um, I uh, want to address, but also uh, uh, in my inference algorithm, but it's, it also allows me to uh, focus my causal discovery in a particular direction to, uh, of, of how I might apply my search. The other setting is one that Clark Seymour and uh, Alexander Murray Waters suggested to me. Apparently, that's something that's quite familiar to those of you working in the biological setting is that you know about a set of input variables up here. You might know something about their causal structure a priori. You know that they have an influence on, an, on a set of output variables that is modulated by some set of unobserved internal variables. And you want to learn something about the causal structure there. This is also a case, a specific setting, very different from the time series setting that I uh, think our methods apply to in a very useful way. So the overall idea then is that we have both the background knowledge and the settings and the different assumptions for uh, um, which this type of set based causal discovery applies. Finally, one of the important things of causal discovery is that you want to ultimately say something about causal effects. So if you have your standard causal inference algorithm and it outputs an equivalence class of causal structures for you, then the question is, well, what are you going to say about uh, a particular prediction of uh, um, a causal effect. If you want to change policy, you want to know what happens to Y when I change W, for example. Uh, well, if the causal discovery algorithm gives you only an equivalence class of graphs, then it's not quite so obvious how you would do that. In particular, the <coughs> do calculus that's developed by Judea Pearl um, generally assumes that you have background knowledge about what the causal structure actually is. That's the unique causal structure. It's not something that we generally get out of the causal search algorithm. <coughs> Again, I think we can say something about it. Okay. At a very high level, then, this is the kind of approach that uh, I'll be presenting. You have your different samples of data. You have your background assumptions that you're willing to make in your particular setting. I'm not going to make the assumption of acyclicity or causal sufficiency. Um, I might have background knowledge in terms of pathways that I know about or tier orderings or priors in the way that I was suggesting earlier. And I might have the particular setting that I'm in. So maybe I'm in the time series setting, maybe I have something <coughs> like the tier structure in biology, or maybe I don't have any particular setting. I'm going to consider the really general search space of causal graphs in a setting where we don't assume that there are, latent, that there are no latent variables and we allow our cycles. What, what, what do we do? What does our uh, uh, approach do? It takes, basically it computes 
conditional independence tests for the uh, different data sets that we have. And um, I write it here as this would mean x is dependent on y in a uh, conditional on the set of variables that are in the set C in an experiment where I've manipulated the variables that are in the intervention set J. Of course, any of those sets may be empty. So an observational study would basically imply conditional independence uh, constraints uh, uh, that for which J is empty. If you have unconditional independence constraints, then the, in, uh, then the C set is empty. So we generate from the different data sets obtained in different experiments or observations, conditional independence tests, <coughs> and use those as constraints for our procedure. Together with all the assumptions that we have about our particular setting, we encode these independence constraints as logical constraints on the underlying graph structure. So the idea is I somehow go from independence constraints and my background assumptions to logical constraints of what is and what is not allowed in the underlying graph structure. That's the overall idea. And then once I've got logical constraints on what the underlying graph structure may look like, then I ship it to a black box. I ship it to the people who have spent their lifetime trying to do constraint optimization and constraint satisfaction and who have developed uh, solvers to do exactly the optimization or the, uh, uh, um, that I'm interested in here. And I'm not going to worry about how that's going to, do, how that's going to be done. So in particular, our method really, all the work happens in encoding what we know about our data, what we can get from our data, and what we know about our background uh, setting. Turn that into a language that off-the-shelf fat solvers understand and then use those to do the optimization. And it's really the, uh, I think, one of the upshots of this work that we've been done is to, that we've found that um, people who have spent a lifetime trying to improve optimization techniques have developed methods in the meantime that outperform the type of constraint optimization techniques that are specific to a domain such as in causality. Right? Or, um, other setting. They've really, uh, uh, it, it's really something where we treat it as a black box. We don't have a good understanding of what happens internally, but we use their guarantees. So let me say in a little bit more detail how this high level spells out. One of the key connections that is often used in causal discovery for the connection between statistical features and the underlying graph, statistical features that we might observe in the data. I don't know what that flickering is, if anyone, since it's not my computer as well. One is worried about um, uh, So one of the, the standard connections between the um, statistical properties that you might find in the data and the underlying graphical properties is given by the assumption of causal Markov and faithfulness. Causal Markov and causal faithfulness basically allows us in a, in a broad sense to align conditional dependence with a certain sense of causal connection that is spelled out in the notion of deconnection. If you're not familiar with this, uh, uh, this short uh, a definition of deseparation is not going to help you. So I'm going to move on and assume that this is uh, uh, going to be relatively familiar to you. Um, I'm going to, the, the, the methods that we have been developing have uh, are built up on this type of back and forth between uh, deconnection and conditional dependence or a deseparation and conditional independence. Just as a little in bracket note for those of you who are very familiar with this type of work, of course it would be interesting to weaken this and use minimality instead of causal faithfulness here, and uh, it's something that we have thought about to some extent. Um, but I won't say more about that now. So uh, the, uh, this is what I just said. X and Y are deconnected given C, so if there's a causal connection in the graph, uh, if and only if the, we see this type of conditional dependence in the data. That's what causal markup and causal faithfulness give us. So the thought is that if we see a probabilistic uh, dependence, then that allows us to formulate constraints on the underlying graph structure. So here's an example of what we would do. Most of you will be familiar with the PC. Uh, well, I, I, I will assume or hope that most of you will have seen the PC algorithm at some point in some form or another before. 
uh, here's what it would do. If you have three variables x, y, and z, and you find that independence, the PC algorithm starts with the complete undirected graph, and then removes the one edge. Um, now note, what's interesting in, the, in this type of uh, graph that you get <coughs> after removing the one edge is that it's not forbidden at this point yet that x is a cause of z and z is a cause of y. Right? Nothing so far has forbidden that. But of course, x is a cause of z and z is a cause of y is a deconnection that would violate that independence. Right? The PC algorithm has a good way of solving that, that type of problem later. But, but if you think of this type of graph right now as an equivalence class, then that uh, uh, causal structure would be in there still. The, uh, so that's the first step. The PC, PC algorithm then proceeds onwards. I, I will not pr pr uh, pursue that. I just want to say in contrast, what the SAT solver, what the SAT based procedure does, it says, OK, if we've got three variables and we're going to encode independence and de dependence relations over those three variables, the first thing is what we're going to do is establish logical variables that represent certain edges. OK, so I'm going to define a logical variable that can be true or false, A, that says x, uh, x causes y is in the true graph. And so when A is true, that just means the true graph contains the edge x to y. And similarly for the other ones. And then for a constraint like x and y are independent, what uh, our method does is it encodes that constraint as a logical function, as a logical constraint over these atoms that have been defined. So in particular, x is independent of y would be encoded as saying, there's no direct edge from x to y, and there's no direct edge from y to x, and there's no, um, no common cause where z causes x and z causes y, and there are no indirect paths. So you can see it's a long conjunction of negated uh, deconnections. And so how, how you encode the entire uh, uh, implications of a particular independence or dependence statement that, that requires some work. But that is the overall intuition. So basically, what, what, the, what the approach does, it, says it writes the independence constraint as a logical constraint, in this case, since it's an independence, as a logical constraint, disallowing any kind of deconnection. And you want to find an, an efficient way of coding all those types of deconnection and deseparation implications. And that's basically where the work that we did uh, occurred, right? And trying to find that type of efficient encoding. OK. So then, more generally, you encode the independence and dependence constraints that you find in your data as uh, logical constraints <coughs> uh, of what type of edges may or may not be in your underlying graph structure. Um, just as we went through uh, previously. Uh, and then you ship those constraints to a satisfiability solver. What does a logical satisfiability solver do? It says, for any particular logical formula, give me an assignment of truth values to the atoms in that formula that make it true. Well, an assignment to, of, of truth values to the at atoms in that formula imply a particular graphical structure, or at least a set of graphical structures. That's what's going on here. And so the actual solving of the constraints of which particular graph structures satisfy the constraints that, that you have input, that is done by your off-the-shelf satisfiability solver. Okay? That, that's, that's the overall thought. So in this case, you shift the constraint there uh, uh, that I show in the second, on the second bullet. You ship that off to a SAT solver, and it will return to you something like, for example, the solution that uh, you have to assign the atom A, which was the edge from x to y, the truth value false, in order to satisfy all the constraints that you have. And then a particular truth value assignment will give you a graph. Now, in general, of course, the constraints may be satisfiable in many ways. That's the underdetermination in that sense. If you have several solutions to your logical constraints, that's the equivalence class that you're getting out of your um, 
uh, cause of discoveries. Okay, um, so this is now a very, very general setting. We can allow for cycles and for latent variables in this setup. And because we just encode the, the uh, uh, deseparation and deconnection relations by definition, you're automatically <coughs> guaranteed completeness because the solvers are guaranteed to find all the solutions uh, uh, for any particular um, uh, set of constraints. So, so worries about whether the, whether there's something in your set of constraints that you've missed out on just don't don't arise because you very easily get the completeness of the method out. I should say, with regard to uh, again, just as a side note for those of you who might be worrying about uh, nifty little concerns here, uh, is that uh, the relationship of of deseparation and deconnection relations in cyclic causal structures is only really fully understood when the cyclic causal structure is um, uh, is linear uh, or linear Gaussian. So, so the extent to which this type of work with regard to cyclicity generalizes to the discrete case or to other cases uh, is still up for debate there. Right? So if you're interested in this, just talk to me later and I'll point you to the relevant papers that worry about this. Okay, so my, my first, I, I hope you see that uh, several of my concerns are, are, are handled here. I, I can now really handle a very, very uh, general search space um, and uh, uh, can do so for a variety of different settings and for uh, lots of different background knowledge. I'll come back to the background knowledge in, in just a minute. But, of course, uh, Unfortunately, statistics and uh, data science doesn't quite, you know, this is where the PhD in logic uh, uh, would have been good <coughs> enough, but uh, 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 for the SAT solver, um, we, we have to deal with statistical test results that um, might conflict. We are not always going to get <coughs> the constraints out that jointly imply a graph, a, a, a set of graphs, or that, that are even satisfiable uh, in general. So you might well get uh, conflicting uh, constraints that in, would imply for a strict SAT solver that you're not going to get any solution graph, any causal graph out at all. Let me give you an example. Suppose that in your data over just three variables, these were the constraints that the independence and dependence constraints that you had found. So um, under suitable standard background assumptions, there is no causal graph that can produce this set of constraints. Uh, uh, that means there has to be some type of error in the statistical tests that were done. So in particular, if you change that constraint there, the third one, and reverse it, then one of the causal structures consistent with that constraint is the one showing there, namely the chain. But if I instead reverse the last constraint, then the unique causal structure consistent with the constraint is the common effect. So if I now in my data, yeah? You're assuming no selection? So yes, yes. For the sake of argument here, let's assume no latent variables, no cycles. Just, I'm trying to give a very simple example. In general, conflicts can arise in much more complicated settings. Yes, no selection. So, um, um, you're right, so you're worried that with selection bias, I might get something that's... I'm w yes. uh, wondering whether your set solver approach in general assumes no selection. Um, that's up to you if you want to code that or not. So so you, if you want to assume that there is no selection bias, that's fine. That's, that's what we've been doing now. If you want to allow selection bias, then you have to encode what type of deconnection relations might be implied, might be due to selection bias. That, that would be something that could be done very easily. Okay, so so if you have these sets of this set of constraints, uh, you're not going to have a solution. Your SAT solver, a, a simple SAT solver, will just say there is no causal graph consistent uh, with any of this. But of course, uh, we want to blame this on the statistical error, and so the question is, how do you resolve the statistical conflict? One of the ways that you might resolve it is that if you had some type of weight or confidence or something like that associated with the um, uh, uh, with each of the constraints, then you would perhaps prefer to hold on to those constraints that you have more confidence in 
So in particular, you wouldn't want to reject the third constraint, but instead rather reject the fourth constraint because you have more confidence in it. But this, of course, uh, just kicks the can down the road because, oh, I missed something there, but because it basically asks, well, uh, um, what type of, where, where do the widths come from? If you have widths, let me let me push that, that question about the, uh, where the widths come from just down another slide. But so if you had widths, then we could ship the whole thing to a MaxSat solver. The, and the the proposal that we are making is to say that, given that we might have conflicted constraints, let's assume that we can have widths for each one of the constraints. What is the causal structure that I want out at the end? Well, I want that causal structure out, which minimizes the sum of the weights of the constraints <coughs> that are not satisfied in the solution. Right. So I get a solution out. That solution will violate some of the constraints that in my input. I want that solution to be such that it minimizes the weighted sum of those constraints that it violates. Um, the thought is that that is one reasonable way of conflict resolution. Uh, and uh, now the question is, where do we get the weights from? OK, where do we get the weights from? We tried a whole pile of different schemes. Some work better than others, as you will see in a minute. But so uh, we, we tried a very simple approach that give every constraint the same weight. It's, there's no, there's no theory behind that. That's just the, the naive approach. So whatever constraint you get from your data, you give it a weight one. And so if your solution, uh, if you have a conflicting con set of constraints in your input, then your solution will just minimize the number of constraints that are not satisfied. Right? It's not, there's, no, there's no aspect of confidence or that you know, higher order conditioning uh, uh, conditional independence tests may be worse than less reliable than, than lower versions. Okay. The approach that we took was to say, okay, let's take classical statistics seriously. Uh, in classical statistics, um, we only reject the null hypothesis. We don't accept it. So we are only going to take the dependencies that we find in our data seriously. We'll give them <coughs> any output that our method gives has to satisfy the dependencies that were found in the data. And then, well, it's easy to satisfy all the dependencies that you find in your data. You just give a complete graph. That satisfies all the dependencies. But then you don't want to do that. You want to have the simplest model, in a certain sense, that uh, satisfies all the dependencies. And what we chose as the, the pressure to keep the model simple was Given that you're satisfying all the dependencies, maximize the number of independencies. You might also say differently that minimize the number of edges or something like that. That, that would be a different simplicity of pressure. But this is supposed to, uh, uh, in some sense, take the uh, uh, view of classical statistical, classical null hypothesis testing. And finally, then, we thought that, well, uh, let's see whether we can do something um, pseudo-Bayesian, uh, and let's see whether we can uh, somehow establish a <coughs> probability or a degree of belief for the independence constraint that we have. So can, is, it, is there a way of saying x is independent of y given c, and I believe that with probability p? And so the approach we took here is a very naive Bayesian model selection where we basically compare the, uh, the, the uh, model that uh, includes the independence against the model that does not include the independence. This is certainly not an ideal way of doing it, certainly not a perfectly accurate way of doing it. It's a, it's a hack that has worked quite well for us. And I should say, again, if you're going to do Bayesian model selection here, then of course there is some type of parametric assumption that is going into it. Sorry, so um, the, the weighting is being done at the level of the, the, the constraints and not at the level of the uh, propositional variables which represent edges? That's right. So I'm going to say x is independent of y given c, and I'm going to assign that statement a weight p. And 
P is depending on which scheme you use, P is defined differently. But that's not fed into the SAT solver. No, well, well that is fed into the SAT solver. <coughs> so, so now we're going to use a max SAT solver that takes the constraint with that weight. And so that weight, of course, percolates through the entire set of implications of that constraint in the SAT solver. And the max SAT solver is now going to give you an output that guarantees that that output minimizes <coughs> the sum of the weights of constraints that are not satisfied. And, and the, the weights are additive now uh, on the edges? And it's not about edges. The, the, the weights are attached to conditional right. independent right. statements. But when, they, when, they're when I sum them up, it's, it's minimizing the sum. That was that sum right there. But, but ultimately, it has to find a model of the edges, right? Yes. And so um, which of those, uh, so the weights minimizing the weights on the edges, each edge may inherit uh, weights from multiple constraints. That's right. That's so right. But so I mean, how it translates to what, what the output uh, how that translates to weights on the edges, I don't know. Okay. So I'm, I'm just committing to uh, the weights go into the SAT solver at the level of the general <laughs> independence constraints, and those obviously, like you say, percolate down as constraints onto the edges. And any particular edge might receive weights from different sides. Okay. He asked another question about are you treating the uh, <coughs> constraints as independent? Uh, yes. Yeah, um, so first, can you take into account the logical uh, relationships among the constraints? Yeah, so, so uh, can is a crucial, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 a crucial uh, uh, you know, what modality are we using here? So we are not doing that at the moment. One of the questions, of course, that arises naturally is that should one have like the uh, independence uh, what, what, calculus or algebra or whatever it's called, where you know that we know about it, we understand reasonably well the how certain independence relations are logically related. Right? I presume that's what you have in mind. So one one uh, proposal would be code that in as a hard constraint. Can you do that? Yes. So can. I do it? But note that I changed the pronoun. Can you do it as opposed to <laughs> <laughs> but can one do it? Yes. Yeah, so I don't actually think, to the extent that the logical relations among the uh, independencies are well understood, uh, it would not be a problem to actually just code them as hard constraints into the solver. Right? And so uh, that, uh, that we have. Yeah. And I always think of the uh, subset method as a specific type of score based research. So basically, you just have a, another measure or another cigar, right? You want to see the consistency of all of those hard constraints. So do you think it would be beneficial to consider the problem this way? So basically, you want to find a better score to, yeah. Yes, so uh, that, that's a hard question and, and requires a long answer. Let, let me just give a very short answer. We say something about that in the appendix to the UAI paper. So where we look at this as a specific way, where we try to analyze this as a score. OK, so uh, well, actually, maybe this, this uh, speaks a little bit to that. So uh, one way uh, that we've been trying to think about uh, uh, this type of um, using probability and, and is that in, in model comparison is that you can think of it of this approach as a probabilistic classifier. Find the graph such that if it were true, the test results would be optimal in the sense of a perfect score. So it's a bit of a, uh, uh, not a standard proper score that one might have along those lines. Anyway, OK, how does this work? Um, we feed the whole thing to a SAT solver. The SAT solver that we're using at the moment is, is Klingo. It's considered the best open source SAT solver on the market uh, um, right now. And we use, as an encoding technique, answer set programming which uh, is, is a certain way that, uh, of, of encoding the logical constraints that avoids having to spell out all the, uh, uh, the entire disjunctive normal form. Um, that, uh, and one of the nice things about the MaxSat 
methods that have been developed is that they guarantee you exactly this type of uh, ideal or optimal solution um, that I was talking about before. You're guaranteed to find the global optimum. You're not going to be stuck in some local optimum. You're going to find the global optimum of the max output. Okay. Remember, these are the different widths, the log widths, the hard dependencies, and the constant widths. They're different weighting schemes. We ran these on for graphs over six observed variables, and we uh, uh, ran the, all the independence tests possible on those six observed variables. And we changed for the independence test the parameter of what counts as a, a independence versus a dependence. And as a measure of true positive rate and false positive rate are the correct or incorrect deconnections in the solution. Okay. No edges. So no, not eight edges. It's, it's correct deconnections and de uh, separations in the solution. So you see that uh, if you just look at the test results themselves, that they provide the lower bound. And if we have the, if we use the log weighting scheme, the pseudo Bayesian weighting scheme, we actually get quite a good, uh, uh, well, well, quite good. We get a better performance than on the other weighting schemes. You might say, well, okay, that's not particularly uh, uh, surprising because there is a certain level of a parametric assumption going in in the basic scheme. Right? So, um, okay, the more interesting question, I think, is, and so I should say, this is on a model space where we've included cycles and gaze variables. Okay. Um, the more interesting thing, I think, is to see, to compare our method in a space where there are competitors. So let's take a space, no cycles, no latent variables, exactly the same setup. And here, uh, yeah, you can't see it. The PC algorithm at the bottom um, uh, does, doesn't do much better than the tests themselves. Uh, you can see the exact score base. So this is an exact Bayesian computation of the posterior uh, and then selecting the graph with the uh, highest posterior probability uh, scores best, perhaps unsurprisingly here. But we're getting awfully close. So we're quite pleased that, so, so our thought is that on a model space where we know that there is an exact computation, um, we're getting awfully close to that exact computation without doing it. Um, and so then you might say, well, what about uh, other spaces? So here we have no cycle, we, we can still have competitors, so there are latent variables, but there are no cycles here, so the FCI algorithm and versions of the FCI algorithm apply. Uh, and um, our method using the log weights does quite well here as well. We, we take this to be uh, a good <coughs> indicator that for those spaces where there are no competitors, in the, in the case where there are cycles and latent variables, we might actually be doing quite well. Okay, one of the worries, of course, is SAT solving is known to be uh, an uh, NP hard problem. And uh, so, so the scalability is naturally a concern. One of the things that we find, and that's well known as a phenomenon uh, in the SAT solver community, is that many instances of the problem are easy to solve, and some are really hard. So this plot shows 100 instances of, that are, uh, uh, of graphs that are sampled under the same circumstances, uh, so, uh, solved by our solvers using the different weighting schemes but sorted along the x-axis to from those who take the least amount of time to those who take the most time. And what you see is for maybe up to 80 instances, this, this is solved in very few seconds. The, the problem is solved in very few seconds. But for the last 20, the, uh, uh, the solving problem really explodes. So um, uh, what this suggests is that for any specific task that you run this method on, you might have a very good day and it will solve it extremely fast, it will be a matter of seconds, or you might be in the space of the particular instance that falls on the back end here where it will take care. Okay, I didn't say anything yet about how, how we would encode background knowledge, so let me just give you some simple examples. If we wanted to now say, I know that there is a path from X to Y, but I don't know how it goes, well, what constraint is that equal to? This is just the constraint in terms of independencies that x is dependent on w in the experiment where you intervene on x. That's what I mean by the double bars. 
That's what it means to have a passage. That's a constraint that I told you before is in our language. We can just encode that for the SATS or ship it off. Right? So that type of background knowledge is trivial to encode. Uh, if you like the idea that uh, your path should not go through Z, yes, you know that there's a path from X to W, but it doesn't go through Z, well, you can encode that too. Just include Z in the intervention set as well. It's still a simple. Uh, um, constraint to encode for the set solver. If you're not confident about the, your pathway, well, add a weight to them. Yes, <coughs> add a weight appropriate to uh, uh, that, that, that will bias the method to um, take that constraint seriously or less seriously. Similarly, you might then say, okay, it now becomes obvious how you ensure tier orderings. You just disallow certain paths, but actually there's a direct way of just encoding orderings of variables in the set solver uh, in, in terms of the uh, 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 a logical formula there. That's, that's even easier. And with regard to the priors, it really depends on what it is that you have. Do you have a specific probability for a specific graph? Well, the graph we can just simply encode and attach a probability to it as a weight and then ship that to the set solver. Is it some type of soft sparsity constraint that you think that in general, I think the nodes will have a certain degree, and I, ha I want to assign a probability to that. That doesn't necessitate that, but that uh, uh, biases the search method in that way. That is also an easy thing to now encode as, as uh, a graphical constraint for the cell solver. So background knowledge is really not uh, much of an issue. I think you really have to come up with quite nifty background knowledge in order for us not to be able to encode it in some way. Okay, let's, I, I, in terms of applying this type of approach to different settings, let me just show you this example uh, on uh, the work of uh, Fleece and Zhang. Uh, remember, on a subsample time series, uh, we're worried about how do we get from the subsampled uh, causal structure back to the uh, original causal structure. This is all that is required to encode that problem for the SAT solver. You know, don't need to understand it. Here's the description of it. It doesn't matter. It's, uh, what, what I wanted to show with that is that it's less than half a page for the SAT solver to encode that problem and then to run it. Let's run it. This is the best method so far by banks and police in terms of running time on uh, you can see there, subsampling rate of two. Now you might say we want larger subsampling rates, and of course we have a different uh, situation. But we run lots and lots of graphs with a dense edge density, I think, of 10% or something like that. The, the basic point of this plot is supposed to be we blow that method out of the water. Right? I mean, the SAT solving approach is really just goes to show here that uh, people have spent a lifetime solving. Uh, doing constraint optimization, and they've packed it into a nice black box, and we're using it. Right? That's, that's uh, what's happening here. So for the specific setting, we actually were able to run up to something like 70 nodes. So uh, I think that's starting to get into a range where you might say, well, this is, this is useful to even larger problems. And note that we time out at an hour, and this is on a desktop. This is not a supercomputer or something like that. So we just cut off the solving problem at an hour. Uh, if you had a supercomputer or you wanted to uh, run it much longer for your specific problem, then of course you can solve much bigger uh, problems here as well. Okay. Finally, then, I want to. Uh, uh, when can I talk? To the 5 2 or something like that? Sure. Okay. Uh, finally, <coughs> then, I want to talk briefly about the output of a search, causal search algorithm. Generally, we like to think that we get a, uh, um, an equivalence class out. In the SAT solver, the way I've been talking is that we get specific a list of graphs that satisfy uh, that each satisfy the constraints that have gone in that we get that out we, uh, and then from that we want to say well can you give us some representation of the equivalence class we can plug all these constraints in can you give us some representation of the equivalence class I want to turn that approach around and say it's the wrong way to go don't output an equivalence class find the answer to the question that you're asking. So you might have a specific query. Uh, you might want to know all the possible causal structures that are consistent with the data that you saw. You might, but you might not care about that. You might say, I, I just want to know what particular edges are you certain about that are true in all the solutions that you find. Or you might say, I don't care about edges. I just care about 
ancestral relations, what type of causes are there, never mind the direct causes, uh, or what type of specific pathways. Maybe you don't care about all the other variables, they all matter to your problem, but really you care about the connection from A to B. Well, then ask that question. And the idea is the SAT solver implicitly represents the equivalence class specified by your constraints. You now ask it a question and it will give you the answer. Uh, for example, it might enumerate all the solutions if that's what you really want. Or it will tell you these are the structural features that are present or absent in all the uh, solution instances. That's called the backbone of the SAT instance. Things that have the same true structural features that have the same truth value in all the solutions of the SAT instance. Or whatever other question you might have. I think it's really, I like the idea, and I, uh, not just because my method does it that way, but I like the idea of uh, not having to interpret an equivalence class, uh, but rather uh, directly ask the question that I'm, that I'm interested in. In particular, I think this helps us with the problem of looking at the computation of causal effects. So if you give me an equivalence class, how am I going to compute the probability of y given do x, given that I've never performed that experiment before? Uh, the one solution might be enumerate each graph in the equivalence class and run the Kian Spitzer algorithm, which is the uh, uh, note that I'm assuming acyclicity for this. Uh, so the Kian Spitzer algorithm for graphs with latent variables, but acyclic graphs, is known to be complete for the computation of causal effects. Um, so you could do that, you could enumerate each graph and then compute the causal effect for each one of them and see whether it's determined that then what the value is of its determination. I want to suggest a different route. I think that, take a look at the do calculus again. This is the old, well old, that's a, a bit of an offense, the, the, the uh, Perl's do calculus, um, the standard way, only that I've rewritten the conditions slightly differently. I've written them as deseparation constraints rather than in terms of graphs whose edges are cut. Yes, it's a it's a very simple translation between what Pearl wrote in the book of the uh, conditions for uh, application of the rule of the do calculus to this. In fact, Pearl in other places wrote these uh, conditions almost like this. These are standard deseparation constraints that we can now apply. We can query these types of deseparation constraints on our equivalence class, not just on a specific graph. So one of the ways that you might say, I'm going to determine the causal effects when I, don't, when I only get the equivalence class of graphs, is that I'm going to see whether I can apply the conditions of the do calculus rules to uh, uh, my equivalence class. And then I'm not even restricted to knowing the specific graph. I can compute the causal effect even for uh, uh, the equivalence class as a whole. Well, so um, in the end, it turns out to the most efficient way is to do a mixture of both. Since I'm out of time, let me just say very briefly what, what we do. At a high level, we compute the equivalence class, leave it implicit in the SAT solver. We sample one solution. We query one solution from the equivalence class. We run the Tian Spitzer algorithm to get the causal effect to compute the causal effect on that specific solution. If it's determined, then we look at the do calculus rules that were applied and look at the conditions that were required to get that causal effect. We then take all those conditions and negate the conjunction of those conditions and put that back into the solver to refine the equivalence class. And that way we iterate it and now we query the next solution. The next solution will be one that requires a different way to compute the causal effect than what we used initially. So the overall point is that, uh, this spells it out in more detail, but the, sorry, the, uh, the overall point is we can do the computation of the equivalence class in a much faster way than enumerating each individual instance. Uh, and it's basically by checking the do calculus conditions on the equivalence class. Here's just the, in terms of uh, time, the comparison for if you enumerated every instance of your equivalence class and then computed the causal effect uh, using the Tian Spitzer algorithm, you'd be using as much time as is on the right hand side. If you take our more efficient way of doing it, then uh, you'd be using the amount of time uh, 
that's shown on the left hand side. I'm happy to say a bit more about that if you want to know the details about it, but I'm almost out of time. So let me just finish up. The do calculus, when we use the SAT solver, enables us to do the computation of the causal effect when the graph structure is not even determined or is still underdetermined. And I think it opens up new questions to think about how we should consider or, def or estimate the causal effect when we know that the graph was established on the basis of conflicted constraints. So what are, what are you going to do? So you know that you've got conflicted constraints that gave rise to your graph. Now I want to know what the causal effect is. Well, one way I think one can think of it is that with the SAT solver, you can really explore the specific constraints that were required in order to establish the conditions for the do calculus rules. And that might, uh, um, uh, so, so you can investigate them more closely. You might me uh, mess around with the weights on exactly those constraints that, that gave rise to the conditions uh, of the uh, do calculus. Moreover, you can easily find multiple, well, well, to the extent that there are, you can find multiple different estimators of the uh, uh, same causal effect. And so it might be that even though the overall graph structure may not be determinable or may be conflicted, uh, um, we might still be able to determine the causal effect without resolving those conflicts. And I think it really gives us a, a new way of thinking about it. So in conclusion, I think this SAT, uh, uh, obviously for your specific problem, you're going to have to do a little bit of coding and adjusting of this SAT approach um, but it's an extraordinarily versatile tool, and you're basically just uh, 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 climbing on the shoulders of all the people who have spent a lifetime improving SAT solvers. You're really not dealing with that problem anymore. Uh, it opens new avenues for handling, handling background knowledge. I think it's now very easy to handle background knowledge and uh, of how we compute causal effects when the causal structure is underdetermined. And I think it really suggests that building your domain-specific constraint solver you're going to have to show that it's better than, uh, or it's not clear to me that it's going to be better than just shipping it off to someone who's worked on that type of problem for years and years and years. The interesting part is happening. How do you encode the constraints for the people who do this, the constraint optimization? It's not in optimizing the constraints. OK. Frederick, uh, the first I think you, you may have just kind of answered um, with respect to uh, the, you know, the work being done on the encoding side, but I'm curious if you've put any thought at all into um, handling the kinds of constraints that we get with tetrads and sextads, uh, in which um, uh, they, uh, they, they ask the question of how uh, the identity of latency is represented. Yeah. I presume that the latency you're talking about so far are just the, the, the dual edges where it doesn't specify uh, the identity of different uh, weight variables. So in tetrad or sextad constraints, those are quantitative constraints. Right? So, so I mean, more generally, you can ask that about uh, linear models where I have uh, estimates of the specific value of the correlation, and I might use track rules to uh, uh, resolve causal structure that I cannot resolve if I just look at uh, uh, independence and uh, dependence between the variables. A SAT solver is a logical solver. It's not, and even the MACSAT solver is logical in that sense. You can, so there are solvers for linear equations, um, but those are nowhere near efficient enough for the for any time. I mean, basically beyond two or three variables, you're not going to be able to do it. But if I feed, uh, if I feed it uh, tests on uh, vanishing tetrad constraints, for instance, um, those imply, um, uh, you know, track separation constraints, uh, which I uh, yes. So so use okay. For separation. Okay. So if you're if you're going to encode specific uh, structural constraints, mm -hmm. then. Yes, so no, we have not done that. Okay. And yes, I think it would be very straightforward. Right. The, the, the tricky part, though, is that now you have to identify latent variables. Yes, but so, so remember the other example I showed was uh, the case with the internal latent variables, the biologicals, for example, right? You have the input and then the latent there and then the output. 
So that, that's not a, okay. so. So in that case, you also want to identify right. the variables. You, I, I mean, just as a quick answer, maybe that gives you some intuition. Is you treat the latent variables as if you had an overlapping data set problem, mm -hmm. where you just happen to never have the data set that includes those variables, and so you just postulate to the solver there are a bunch of variables out there that may or may not be connected to what you're doing here, uh, and then it will pull those variables in as needed and, and identify them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one other quick question. So um, uh, it seems like one of the strengths of this is that uh, in general, you, you don't have to run all the, the independence tests or, or tests of whatever kind that you, you want. You can, you can give it any subset of, of constraints. But then that has to, raises the question of um, you know, scheduling tests, which tests yeah. do I run? So, I mean, how can you address that question? Yeah, so we don't. Uh, so, um, we were debating that a fair bit this morning already. So, um, we don't have any suggestions or policy. Well, well, we have suggestions, but we don't have any policy on how to schedule the sequence of independence tests. Um, one of the things uh, uh, that we found, or, or that I think is, was well known before, is that of course, if you start sequencing tests, then you're putting yourself at risk of making errors, uh, of, of being subject to the errors that you make early on. But that needn't be a problem because you might go back and check and add another couple of additional tests. So the short answer is the, the approach we have taken is just do all the tests at any level and start from unconditional tests, then one level up, and then go as far as you can or before your, your SAT solver starts choking. Um, and uh, uh, process them uh, that way. If you like a particular schedule, and of course, right, ship them that schedule, but uh, yeah, we don't have anything really it, informative right, to say it, about it. It does it. seem like with the capacity to handle uh, conflicting constraints, that does seem like it's uh, actually one of the, the strengths of this approach is that you can sort of uh, strengthen the schedule of the tests um, so that uh, depending on if you get conflicts or not, you can actually uh, run more tests to try to find a well, but the worry is about the conflicts that you never see, right? That you, because of your schedule. Yeah. So, when you do the constraint optimization, is the way you get the equivalence class, is that when the sum of the weights is exactly identical? Is that how you, is that how you get an equivalence class in those situations? Or, or how does that work? When, which, which graphs are treated as equivalent when you're doing that? Maximizing or minimizing the sum ah, of the weights. Okay, so so uh, uh, that's a good question. So one way is to say uh, all graphs with the highest score are equivalent. So you basically just check, and, and so they might not be Markov equivalent. Right? So uh, so you just check for all the graphs uh, that that have that, that highest score, and then call that an equivalent. The but because of interventions, because there were no interventions, they don't work the same, right? Well, um, you don't even have to have a an Markov equivalence class, class, class that all get the same score. Yes, but there might be two Markov equivalence classes that get the same score. Right, that's what I was asking. Yeah. So, so, but, but you see, I mean, I'm trying very hard to move away from talk about equivalence classes because uh, what you take to be equivalent is in my mind, largely up to you. And so uh, here is a way of making different things or considering different equivalences. I think the, the move, the, the approach I would take is take all the highest scoring graphs that, that, uh, uh, and call them equivalent. And that constitutes the equivalent. And so graphs that are, that are a mark of equivalent modulo the experiments that you did uh, um, would all get that high score. So I want to ask a question about the uh, <coughs> the scoring method you were using in the ROC curves, which was basically you were taking a false positive or a false negative for deconnections that were predicted by the output compared to the true. So that strikes me as an interesting thing to do. But um, the other thing, uh, the other <coughs> way I'd be interested in asking if you consider or, or you would, would be sort of taking the set of queries about the effective interventions that one might ask, and then adding those up and seeing how many are. Yes, that's all. Because um, I mean, I mean, you know that this is a, a how are you going to score causal graphs 
that uh, the structure of causal graphs, right? So that that's a general problem. And so you could do all possible interventions, right? And all possible intervention queries, and then compare that to the intervention queries on the true graph, right? You could do all of that. So we considered that. Uh, um, we didn't do it because there were so many of them. Um, uh, so I don't know what the good answer is to the comparison between. So I mean, you know that, or maybe you know this work by Jonas Peters on structural intervention distance. I think that's one approach. I'm not particularly convinced by it. Uh, um, but that's he's he's I think addressing exactly that problem as well in a different way and saying that you want to look if you if you're scoring causal graphs you want to look at uh, intervention queries so yes I I take that on board fully as that but you haven't um, done that in the no we did, I, I mean so so we we have done that but I don't have a plot to show you so uh, I can tell you it looked great, <laughs> it looked great. <laughs> way better. <than> <laughs> So, uh, what is the state of software availability and documentation? Um, all of this is so. So the uh, method is available um, online. It's free. It's uh, you, you have to download the SAT software from somewhere else, uh, but that's also openly available. Um, uh, documentation could be better. Uh, Let me put it this way. I mean, I've I've been messing around with this code, and you know, I wish I had a lackey who I could tell. Yeah, to don't we all wish we had lackeys? Uh, uh, is the representation? Can, can I can I just say one thing? Or the, the the software is in such a state that it reproduces that it regenerates the stuff that we have in the paper. And so you can go from there and then adjust it to your settings. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, but it's not beautifully annotated with what's going on here. I just stuff. So representation, sorry. Oh, that, that was. What's the general complexity when you search the graphs? Uh, I assume if you just you greedily find all the these separation and then you code it. So no, 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 no. So, so uh, we, I mean, this, this was to the question of scheduling the, the tests. You do whatever tests you want, right? If you want, if you just want to have a policy of testing, uh, um, uh, of sequentially doing all the unconditional tests, all the conditional tests, that would work just fine for us. If you like to do something greedy and about how you select your tests. Mm -hmm. Fine with us too, but then comes the warning of you might be doing, you, you might be subject to the errors that you make early on in your greedy approach. So uh, uh, um, the the method is not sensitive in any way to how you select your tests. It ultimately cares is that what tests do you have, and then we do the encoding so that you can talk to the SAT solver. And the, what the SAT solver does internally. Is the black box? Yes, that's what I'm. Uh, and and there are greedy aspects to it. However, the solution guarantee is global. Right, you're getting a global option. Uh, did you look at GPT's algorithm for the do calculus? Yes. Yes. So that's incomplete. Yes. Uh, and so this is complete. Well, yeah. That could be incorporated as a step. I mean, we're sort of Yes, but the alternation was a matter of efficiency, not a matter of. Uh, um, uh, it, it just turned out to be faster in the interaction right, between so us. I'm, I'm asking about whether it might be more efficient to try and use that in <coughs> cases where it gives an answer. So you get one answer in the cases, right, that, it, that it can handle, and then you handle the other cases. Separate. Yes, but so and, and well, so several things. One is, I mean, then we are restricting ourselves to observational data. I don't know how easy it would be to adapt that to. I mean, it's about. Uh, I, I I'm not sure what you mean by that. I mean, you've got a PAG and you've got some manipulations. That's yeah. So, so, but hang on. So, let me backtrack. So, 
By Gigi's algorithm, you mean Gigi's implementation of the do calculus on packs? Or yes. So in the original paper, there wasn't an algorithm for that. There was. He showed that it was. Uh, uh, he showed that it was correct, and then he had the one example where it was incomplete. Right. So, so now I'm not I'm not entirely sure what yeah, you're referring to. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess that's the point. I guess I guess I, I'm just trying to think whether there's some way to leverage to get some efficiency out of the fact that there are at least some calculations that are sort of that all you need is the peg and you're getting all the answers to the entire equivalence class at once. Um, but you know, I guess what you would need is a better way of um, employing that calculus. Yeah, so yeah, I'm I'm not sure how uh, how that would go. I mean, the, the one bottleneck that we're experiencing at the moment is uh, figuring out in the Tian Spitzer algorithm what do calculus rules the moves in the Tian Spitzer algorithm correspond to. And so we have a very uh, brute force way of solving that problem. And Thomas Richardson mentioned that one might be able to figure that out more directly, but it doesn't. See, but he said that more work needs to be done. So, so I'm I'm waiting for that solution to come, and then we can we can uh, sh shortcut one of the longer steps. Yeah. But so I just don't know what exactly it would be from Gigi. Well, I mean, uh, you, you can turn his constraints into the search algorithm over finding the formulas that satisfy them. Yeah. And there are some simple uh, constraints you could use to cut down the size of that. So it would be sort of, could you, could you, instead of doing a search over all the graphs in some sense, do it over the different uh, mags, for example, where uh, you're applying then, you know, uh, if, if you can find a single one that satisfies the formula that he's got that you know that he's done it wrong. Yeah, so you're saying moving it from what we're doing at the moment, if you have a graph that implies a certain sequence of do calculus operations, we now remove all the graphs from the solution that use that sequence of do calculus operations. Could we remove even more? So I, I, I just simply don't think. I wonder if you, uh, if, if Adam's suggestion wasn't dismissed too quickly. So, uh, Geiger, Geiger and me pointed out that uh, linear models are representable essentially as systems of real algebra statements. But in fact, uh, it's true for any polynomial linear function. Uh, so the computer algebra complexity for deciding certain questions over classes model, for example, whether two models imply an equivalent set of constraints, uh, is worst case. Yeah. But when you're looking at tetrad constraints, you're essentially just looking at two classes of constraints. You're looking at vanishing partial correlations, and you're looking at these quadratic constraints. And that complexity is much lower. Uh, and these are propositionally re representable. So it's not clear to me at all that your strategy wouldn't work. Um. <laughs> well, I mean, so the, I guess I want to go two ways on that. So yes, uh, the Meek and Geiger paper shows that basically if we had 
strong enough solver then. So this is back to the Tarski method, right? So yeah. that's, the, that's what Kaplan is. Well, improvements on the Tarski method. Yeah, but, but still massively uh, Right, but think about what it's massively for. Well, well, well okay, so, so you're saying now I have a small subset of those constraints. I suppose I, I just don't know the answer to the question, but what I would do would be look for what are the solvers on the shelf that people have for those types of constraints, uh, and what are the fast ways of translating those constraints into logical constraints? I don't know. I, I simply don't know what, what the answer to that is. So the idea of trying to resolve conflicts when there are inconsistent constraints is key, I can see, uh, to making this useful practically. Um, in, 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 in the case of latent variable models, um, we solve a version of the problem by instead of looking at the set of constraints that might not be um, consistent, but we take out variables. Because sometimes variables are involved in lots of constraints that don't hold and should in some, in some way of thinking of things. I'm, I'm wondering if you could do the same sort of thing here. I mean, when you actually have a set of variables, some of them might be measured terribly. Some of them might be involved in lots of weird things because parametrically, the way they depend on other things doesn't fit your system. So I, I wondered if there was a way you could imagine to cut out variables instead and then check to see um, you know, how close you are now to a consistent set of constraints that would be satisfied by a graph. Because what you're having to do when you have inconsistent constraints is do the weighting and then say, you know, we're just going to have to sacrifice some of the consistency right? do the best we can by doing the weighting. So no, I, I haven't uh, not, understood not, the problem yeah, completely. So what? Uh, so so uh, you, you have a set of variables. Yeah. And then if you have inconsistent constraints that are holding, yeah. right? You're using a weighting scheme yeah. to say, yeah. let's take a set of constraints, right, uh, that we can produce by some graph, yeah. right? So it minimizes the inconsistency. Yeah. Okay. So suppose instead of doing that, you just took out a variable. But I mean, does that not imply that I'm taking out constraints? It would. It would take it would set up, take out a whole set of constraints. But so be, you're saying you say, oh, oh, okay, now I understand. So you want to say take out that variable such that or that I get uh, a consistent graph or something. Like that, the for the remaining graph. Right. right. Because instead but of so, yeah, but so I, I guess uh, and the reason yeah, I, I, I think that that should be fairly straightforward actually because it's basically just a selection of the constraints that you're taking in and out. Right. So uh, you would be saying that if I take this variable out, then I remove all of these constraints, thereby these conflicts go. Yeah. So so I I mean we haven't done that. I haven't thought about that about doing it that way before uh, because it somehow seems like. I'm just not going to look at the problems that I have in my system. But, but, uh, um, well, I just ask because there's you know, many circumstances in which one variable is bizarrely conceived or bizarrely measured. It may be the source of a lot of problems that the empirical, the empirical case actually confronts. But, but I mean, what, what, you're, what you're taking out then, I mean, in, in, if but one way that the variable might be poorly measured is that you also have very low confidence on all of those tests. That are causing trouble, in which case they will be very low weight, and so those are the constraints you're going if, to drop out if, anyway. If you but, knew, if you knew to code that. Right? But, but so, but so, no. But on the on the other hand, I mean, in the case where it would make a significant difference is that you were actually very, very confident about some of the constraints connecting that variable, and so you are still going to knock out that take out those constraints because they, they, that takes the variable out. Right? That's the, so, so you have a peculiar conflict between um, high confidence in some of the constraints to that variable and otherwise being conflicted over that variable that, such that you prefer to take that variable yeah, out. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not just confidence in, in the measurement. It's in the Tetrad case, what we're worried about is that we're trying to constrain the search space to something reasonable, something simple. And this guy is messing up the simplicity. So it's not that we think he's poorly measured. We think he's got all kinds of complicated connections all over the place, and we don't actually care what they are. So we're not getting rid of him because we're not confident. We're actually quite confident that, yes, he is indeed dependent on, you know, there's all kinds of weird dependencies. 
got. We just don't care what they are, and we don't care what they're valued. So what we're trying to do is, is, is to, so what we need is an objective function which trades off how many variables you've got versus how closely you've satisfied the constraint. Right. Yeah, I mean, so, okay. I, I still would think that would be a fairly, I mean, it would take some little bit of thought, but I would have thought that's a fairly straightforward way of that to solve. So it would work very well. We have to go to lunch, but I would take my senior. So. Okay. <laughs>